Good morning. It is Sunday, August 8th. This is our sermon for Booster Friends Church. And as always, we encourage you to join us live uh, in person. Um, or you can watch us live on our Facebook page, our website, BrewsterFriends.com, or in our Brewster Friends app, which you can find uh, also on our website. Or if you, uh, you want that app and having trouble finding it, um, contact me through here and I'd be happy to, uh, to send you a link that, that you can download that. It's a way that you can stay connected with us in many other ways, including watching these sermons, taking notes, um, submitting prayer requests. There's all kind of things that you can do on that app um, to uh, with us and, and to stay connected with us. We uh, have been studying the book of Jeremiah. And this week is, was Vacation Bible School at, uh, at our church. And we talked about Jesus' power with the kids throughout the week. And each, each night was a different lesson in what Jesus' power can do for us. And uh, the first night was that Jesus' power helps us do hard things, <clears throat> which is an important lesson. It's an important lesson for all of us because we often think that Jesus' power um, gets rid of the hard things. It, uh, it, it makes hard things not happen. And that's not true. There is no promise in Scripture that, that hard things aren't going to happen uh, with Jesus in our lives. In fact, the opposite is true. Jesus tells us, in this life you will have trouble. So we shouldn't be surprised by the hard things that, that come our way. Um, so I was leading games. And uh, the games... Um, aren't just games to go outside and have fun during VBS. It is a, uh, a way, f- kind of like an object lesson, a way to reinforce the, the point. And so in this game, they had to, to do some hard things that they needed help with. And um, then it would sit down and ask them questions to, to you know, kind of reinforce the Bible point for the day. Um, so that particular time I asked them, uh, you know, we asked what was hard about the game and then we asked, what are some hard things that you go through in life? And there, there were a lot of typical answers for kids, uh, school, math, homework, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, some more serious like uh, losing loved ones and uh, the pain that comes from that. But one group I asked, what... Uh, what are some hard things you go through in life? And a little boy raised his hand, and right away he said, taxes. He has yet to experience the hardship of taxes, but apparently he already knows about it. I'm not sure that Jesus' power helps us with taxes, preach as well, but um, there are hard things that we're going through in life. It's not, again, not a question of whether or not we go through hard things. It's not a question of will hard things happen. They do happen. They will happen. They probably are happening. It's a question of what are the hard things you're going through right now. Maybe right now you're enduring some some hardship at your workplace. Maybe right now you're going through some hard things in your marriage or with your kids. Maybe you're going through through some hard things with, with your extended family. Maybe you're going through through hard things just in your finances with, with debts or, or bills or or there's medical problems. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you have sickness or cancer. Somebody you know and love is is struggling. Maybe you owe taxes. I I don't know what the hard things you're going through in life are. But I know you're going through hard things. And the question isn't, are we going through hard things? The question today is, do you trust Jesus in those hard things? Do you trust the power of Jesus to help you get through those hard things? Not to change them, not to make them not happen, not, not to make them disappear, but to help you get through them, to, to persevere, to endure through the struggle that that is the hard things we face in life. Because sometimes... We feel like God's power isn't helping us in the hard things. When we're going through them, when we're stuck in them, we we question and we wonder, where is God? Where is His power? Why isn't He doing what I expect God to do? Why, as we're studying in Jeremiah, we've talked about the hard things that they're going to go through. We already looked in Jeremiah 39 at 
the hard things they do go through. It's what God's prophesying about. There's a hard thing coming. It's a, a, a brutal, cruel thing. And we might ask ourselves, why wasn't God's power there to prevent it from happening? But it's the wrong question. When we start to ask that question of the, these hard things happen, why God? Why Why do they happen? Why, why would you allow something like this to come into my life? The question there wasn't where was God's power. The question is, why didn't the people trust in God and in his power? This hard thing happened in their lives because they were trusting in something else. And Jeremiah is written to a people who are mired in idol worship. Now that's not why all the hard things happen in our lives. You don't pay taxes because you worship idols. And sometimes it is. But it's not just that. It's that God's power wasn't there for them, wasn't available for them, for most of them, during that hard time because they didn't trust in Him. We have this false expectation that we can, we can go about and worship other things. We can trust in ourselves. We can trust in the things of the world. We can live life however we want to. And then when the hard things happen, God's power is supposed to be there and work on our behalf. We can live life however we want. It's like God and His power we put up on the shelf. And when we need it, when we want it, we pull it down. And now, God, you can do what we want. And that's not how God works. It's not how a relationship works. Some relationships work that way. And if you have somebody in your life that's like that, who just who calls you when they need something, who calls you when they have problems, who wants to get together with you when 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 they need somebody to just to, to vomit all all of life's struggles with, or, or or somebody who's just, you know, at wants to call and ask you for money or or, or call and ask you for a favor, or, but isn't a isn't a friend, has no relationship outside of that, that's not a friendship. That's not a relationship. And you dread when that person calls. The question that we should ask ourselves as we see God's people in Jeremiah uh, in, in what they endure and what they go through and what God keeps telling them is going to happen. The question is not, does God's power work the way that he says it does? The question is, do we trust in God's power in our day-to-day -day life? Or do we only want God's power as some kind of lifesaver, as a life jacket, as a safety net? When the hard things come, there's God's power to grab a hold of and grab onto and it'll save me again. And then when I get back on the shore, I can go about doing what I want and I can just forget about God until I need Him again. That's not how trust works. That's not how God works. And as we see here in Jeremiah... And we're going to look in chapter 10 today. And this is one, as we read throughout this, uh, Jeremiah is talking about idol worship throughout. It is a, a constant theme because it's the problem that's it's what's keeping them from trusting in God's power. It's what's keeping them from building the kind of relationship with God that allows them to, to tap into his power when they need it, to get through the hard things that are coming. And as we read it, we hear of their idol worship and we hear kind of the simplistic, almost ridiculous way that Jeremiah explains it. And it will cause us to, to say to ourselves, we would never do something like that. But as we look closely, we'll find that that's not true. And that this is a problem in our lives and keeping us from trusting in God just like it kept them from trusting in God and His power. So let's start with verse 1 in Jeremiah chapter 10. And it says, Hear the word of the Lord, that the Lord speaks to you, O Israel. This is what the Lord says, Do not act like the other nations who try to read their future in the stars. Do not be afraid of their predictions, even though other nations are terrified by them. Their ways are futile and foolish. They cut down a tree and a craftsman carves an idol. They decorate it with gold and silver. They fasten it securely with hammer and nails so it won't fall over. Their gods are like helpless scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot speak and they need to be carried because they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of such gods, for they can neither harm you 
nor do you any good. <clears throat> so, in Jeremiah, we've seen um, that the, all of God's people put themselves in this bad position in these hard times because of the rampant idol worship. In Jeremiah, here in this passage, is going to contrast the, the idols that they've chosen to worship versus the God that they should be worshiping. <clears throat> he starts out talking about the stars, um, which we, we know that that uh, Babylon um, r- really began this study of the stars and astrology, and they looked to the skies for signs. And, and, and Jeremiah is saying, don't stop looking to the stars for your future. I'm telling you what's going to happen. They're listening to... Um, to the wisdom of the world rather than the wisdom of God. And he's saying, there, don't be afraid of their predictions. Be afraid of the predictions that God's giving you. And then he, he describes the idols that they worship in, in an almost over-simplistic, ridiculous way. People cut down a tree. They carve out an image. They carve out an animal, a goat, a sheep, a, a bull, something. Something to represent these false gods. They decorate it. They make it look valuable. They, they put silver and gold on it. And then he says, then have to nail it to the shelf. Because that God, that idol you've made, can't even stand up by itself. He compares them to scarecrows. You're like, scare, these gods are like scarecrows who can't speak, who can't walk. A scarecrow that nobody's afraid of. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. But then in verse 6, Jeremiah is going to talk about God. Lord, there's no one like you. For you are great and your name is full of power. Who would not fear you, O king of nations? That title belongs to you alone. Among all the wise people of the earth and in all the kingdoms of the world, there is no one like you. People who worship idols are stupid and foolish. The things they worship are made of wood. They bring beaten sheets of silver from Tarshish and gold from Apaz, and they give these materials to skillful craftsmen who make their idols. Then they dress these gods in royal blue and purple robes made by expert tailors. But the Lord is the only true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. The whole earth trembles at His anger. These nations cannot stand up to His wrath. So here's the contrast between these false idols and God. He says there's no other gods who can do what God can do. God, there's nobody like you. You have actual power and you do actual things and and, and you've done all these wonders and these false gods have done nothing. Remember he said these gods are like scarecrows that nobody's afraid of, but he says everybody fears you. Who doesn't fear the true God? He talks about how these idols are made by human hands and then decorated and to make them look valuable. But God is the one who creates, not the one who's created. God is living and these idols are lifeless. God is everlasting and these idols, are, are, are they come and go. He gives them this verse in Aramaic. It's verse 11, the next verse. And Aramaic was the language of the Babylonians. So it's almost like God is giving them these words. Here's what you say to people who who want you to worship their idols. Verse 11, Say to those who worship other gods, Your so-called gods who did not make the heavens and earth will vanish from the earth and from under the earth. The greatest contrast that, that Jeremiah keeps laying out is God created everything. And the gods you're worshiping, you created. You should worship the one who creates not the one who has been created. You should worship the one who made the heavens and the earth, not the one who appeared in the earth and will disappear from the earth. These gods, he keeps saying, they will become nothing. That's what he points out in verse 15 and 16. Idols are worthless. He's used that word throughout. Jeremiah, we've seen it. These idols have no value, they have no real power, they can do nothing in your lives. They are ridiculous lies. What they promise you, they cannot keep, they cannot do. 
On the day of reckoning, they will be destroyed. But the God of Israel is no idol. He's a creator of everything that exists, including Israel, his own special possession. The Lord of heaven's armies is his name. Even the heavens are, are, are commanded by him. He created all things. Now, this seems pretty easily understandable to us, right? Of course, something that you have made from a tree and then bedazzled doesn't have power in your lives. We are far too intelligent and refined and have moved past the understanding of these ancient cultures who were fool and foolish enough to worship something made from a tree, decorated with their artwork, and then worship it. We would never do anything like that, would we? Except this... Is made by a tree from our hands. We even decorated it. Some of them we even made out of silver and gold. Put our pictures, we put phrases, we put things all over it, and then we value it. Each value is decorated differently, and we certainly live as if this has a whole lot of power in our lives. Now, this isn't a sermon about money. It's not a sermon about the worship of money. But I'm simply illustrating to you that we have the same problem that the people Jeremiah is speaking to had. We trust things other than God to have power in our lives. We do these ridiculous, foolish things just like they did. We trust things other than God to make a difference in lives. We trust, when we trust in these other things, we worship them. We're, we're saying these things have a place of prominence and power in our hearts, in our minds, in our families, in our nation, in everything. The question for us today isn't, isn't really do we trust things other than God to have power in our lives? The question is what other than God do you trust to have power in your lives? Friends, I want you to hear and know today how vitally important this issue is. Not just for, it's, it's not some time-sensitive message that just applied to Jeremiah's people. It is a message for us. God spoke about idolatry more than anything else. The first thing that God talked to his people about, when, when he made a covenant with them, when he said, here's the standards of our relationship, the standards of relationship between me and my people, the first things that he talked about were worshiping idols. In fact, the first two things, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no graven images, no uh, carved trees decorated in gold and silver that you nail to uh, your shelves. The first two commandments in God's Ten Commandments are about idol worship. There's one about murder. There's two about idol worship. Because every culture... Is dominated by its own set of idols. Every culture gives its heart and its priorities and its trust and its power to something else. It's not about wood carvings. It's not about paper money. It's about what has our hearts. Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 14.3, and Ezekiel is talking to the same people that Jeremiah is talking to. He says there, Son of man, these leaders have set up idols in their hearts. It's not about idols they set up in high places. It's not idols that they've nailed to the shelves. God is concerned that these idols have been given the position in their, in their hearts that should be God's. And so the question is, how do we know what we've trusted our hearts to? What have we given our hearts to? What have we said, this is, has that place of power and prominence in my life and what I really trust in when the hard things come? <clears throat> four quick lessons I want you to really think about and how to determine it, how to look and see. How do, I, how do I figure out what I've given my heart to other than God? First of all, and we use that word idol. 
when we're using the word idol, we're talking about something we've given our heart to. It's not just something we, it's not something you put on a shelf and bow down and worship. It's something that you have given that place of power and prominence, something that you have trusted in your heart when and where you should be trusting God. Number one, anything can be an idol and everything has been an idol. An idol is not an idol because of what it is. An idol is an idol because of what you make it. You give it importance. You give it power. You put it in that place of prominence. It's not an idol is is this thing or looks like this or is carved from a tree and, and glued to, to a shelf. No. An idol is an idol because of the position you've given it in your hearts. Number two, an idol is anything that fills God's place. Anything you trust to do in your life, what only God can do in your life is an idol. Anything that fills your heart instead of God, anything that fills your mind instead of God, anything that fills your imagination and dreams instead of God, anything that you you try to fill the emptiness and voids in your life with instead of God, anything that you think is going to mend up the brokenness in your life instead of God is an idol. Number three, anything you can't live without is an idol. That saying is the epitome of trusting in the wrong thing. If you find yourself saying that, oh, I can never live without that. I can never live without them. I can never live without these things in my life. You're trusting that with too much power in your life. You're saying my life is dependent on that person, on that thing. I, I, my life ceases to exist without that. That is what gives me meaning. It's what gives me purpose. That, that uh, It's what my identity, my happiness, my peace, my joy is all dependent on that one thing. I promise you, you can live without it. But you've put it in a place in your heart where that one thing is your God. Number four, anything you hope in is your idol. It's not just things that we have that we worship. It's often the things that we don't have, but we want and we desire that we worship. It's the things that we hope in. Those things that we say, if I just had. If I just had more money, life would be so much better. If I just had a different job, if I just had a better marriage, if I just had a different relationship, if I just had more friends, if I just had kids, if I just had more kids, if I just had less kids, if I just had older kids, if I just had younger kids, if I just had better kids, if I just had a bigger house or a smaller house or lived in a warmer state or a colder state or just somewhere else, if I just becomes your God, you put your hope in something that will fade. You put your hope in something that will fail. You put your hope in something that doesn't have the kind of power in your life that you're hoping that it does have. Because all those things won't give you the meaning and the purpose. and It won't change your life the way that you think they will. The question today is do you trust in God's power? It's what are you trusting instead of God's power? What have you given that place uh, a prominence and power? What have you put in place of God? What have you said I can't live without? What have you hoped in? Instead of hoping in the power of God. All this reminded me, it made me think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor, a theologian, who took a stand against the, the Nazis' rise to power. And it wasn't like after it had been exposed and when the whole world knew, he started right away. In fact, um, Hitler had only been chancellor two days when Bonhoeffer got on the radio and, and spoke out against him. So the rest of the country was seemingly hopeful of, of Hitler. The church was bending a knee to, his, to Nazi power and Bonhoeffer was speaking out against them. He was uh, the first voice in the church to speak out against the, the Nazi persecution of the Jews. Before, long before anybody knew the extent or horror of that. Those early days, he wrote this book called The, the Cost of Discipleship. And it, it's still seen as a classic to this day. It's uh, almost 80 years since it's been written. <clears throat> the German word for the title means the, the act of following. He wrote of what it would cost to live for and follow Jesus in a world that was opposed to that. But he didn't just write about it. He lived it out. Because as Nazi power grew, he was harassed and he was silenced and he was imprisoned for 18 months. And then 
He, he was in prison supposedly awaiting a trial that never came. He was moved around after those 18 months until he actually ended up in, in two different concentration camps. And then he was executed with a trial um, where there were no records, no witnesses, and no defense was allowed. All um, because he took a stand to trust in the power of God and to trust in what God and who God had told him to be, uh, much like Jeremiah was doing in the face of of the many powers of the world around him. Uh, if you're searching for an example of what it really looks like to trust in God's power during hard times, it is men like Dietrich Bonhoeffer that are the answer. Because how does one give their heart so fully to Jesus that they could stand up against that kind of power and pressure? Not just men like him that I, I, I hear of missionaries today in these parts of the world where where the gospel is, is opposed and where, where Jesus can't be talked about openly. And here, the, the pressures that, that they face, and you, you wonder, how? Bonhoeffer wrote these words in that book, The Cost of Discipleship. If we ask how, are we to know where our hearts are? The answer is just simple. Everything that hinders us from loving God above all things and acts as a barrier between ourselves and our obedience to Jesus is our treasure and the place where our heart is. How do they do it? They get rid of all the things in their lives that hinder them from loving God. It's not that they don't have anything else. They don't allow those things to get in the way of living for God. They don't get allow those things to get to be become an obstacle in their act of following. They're willing to give those things up to be a disciple of Jesus. So the, the simple words are what you value and treasure or where your heart is. And where your heart is is your God. Some of your hearts are up on the shelf right next to that bedazzled idol super glued there. They can't speak it can't stand on its own, that has no power in your life, and yet you've given your heart to it. Anything that gets in the way of our hearts entirely being in God's hands, from trusting our lives into God's hands, from putting our hope in Jesus alone, might as well be one of those gold-plated wooden carvings that we've nailed to the shelf. Because their power in our lives is just as great as that piece of wood meaning none. If the hard times have set in and you've given up, if the hard times have come and you feel empty and broken, if the hard times are here and you've just lost hope, then you need to start looking at where your heart is. Start looking at what you value and live for. Start asking yourself, what do I really trust in today? Because if anything is hindering you from living wholeheartedly for Him, you're cutting yourself off from the power you need to overcome those hard times in Christ Jesus. Father God, we come to you today and we ask that you would help us to see in our hearts what we've allowed to keep us from you. We ask that you help us to see what we value instead of you, what we trust instead of you, what we hope in instead of you, and how those things are worthless and powerless in our lives in comparison to you. Because some of us are struggling in hard times and, and we are sinking, we are drowning. And there are people listening to this who, who are questioning, who are wondering, where is God's power? I hear about it. Where is it? And the problem is that we've trusted in those things we've built for ourselves instead of in you. Father God, 
May we see today that what we treasure, what we value is where our heart is. And if you are not what we treasure and you are not what we value and you are not what we trust and hope in, then our heart isn't where it needs to be. May we put our hearts back into your hands today so that your power would get us through the hard times that come, would give us the patience and perseverance and peace we need to overcome, to endure. We pray today that we would see the things in our lives that are hindering us from coming to you and get rid of them so that our hearts would be yours and yours alone. Verse 12, Jeremiah wrote, God made the earth by his power and he perseveres it by his wisdom. With his own understanding, he stretched out the heavens. When he speaks in the thunder, the heavens roar with rain. He causes the clouds to rise over the earth. He sends the lightning with the rain and releases the wind from his storehouses. What Jeremiah is telling the people is this. God's power is evident and you can see it if you look for it. Whereas the idols that you've put on your shelves, the things that you've put the gold plates on and nailed so they don't fall down, they've shown you that they're powerless. They've shown you that they don't work. So start trusting in the God who's shown you his power and put aside the gods who've come up empty in your lives time and time again. I pray that you would see what you value today, that you would trust your heart to God alone today, that you would put your hope in Jesus Christ today, not just so that he would save you, not just so that he would go to heaven, but so that right now, in the midst of these hard times, he would give you the power and peace and endurance you need to get through it. It only comes from him. He's the only one you can trust to give you what you need today. Put your trust in him and see how Jesus' power can help you through your hard times.